Ladies and gentle soars, welcome back to Orbis Pagona, my little bearded dragon seed world. In our last episode, we discussed three different species that evolved to fill some empty predator niches, starting up an evolutionary arms race that will be fought throughout the history of our little planet. Today, we'll talk about how some beardies have adapted to avoid or deter predation. Before we get into it though, do me a quick solid and leave a like on the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and go ahead and leave a comment once you've finished. Also, check out the Patreon if you want to help me make more videos more frequently, or just support the channel in a general sense. The lowest tier is only $3 a month, and it gives you access to a special Discord role and a patron chat, some patron-only updates and polls, and you also get to see your name on the patron board at the end of the video. What we have on screen here is a family tree I made to represent how our beta dragons have evolved so far, and who they are descended from. I'm calling this suborder Pagonia because the descendants of Orbis Pagona's original progenitor species have diversified enough to be granted a suborder of their own. Again, I'm not a biologist and the phylogeny here is probably not entirely correct, but it's really something I made just to get my creative wheels spinning on the project again. As you can see, we have five main groups so far, the Neutrosaurids, or the Necked Lizards, who are distinguished by their elongated vertebrae and no control of their dewlap. Sable Draconids, or the Savage Dragons, distinguished by their sliding jaws and beak-like tooth. Galabinae, or the Gluttons, distinguished by their split lower jaws. Hydropagone, or the Waterbeards, distinguished by their webbed feet and streamlined build. And then there are our Pagonas, like Viticeps orbicia, Heterospiculum, Galabus, Sandaris, and Lingotox, who are all still very genetically similar to the progenitor species. Also, here is a redesign of the Neuchosaurus, which I hope will stand as a testament to how my art has improved since starting the channel. When you look at a bearded dragon for the first time, chances are the very first thing you'll notice is the large amount of spikes covering their entire body. If I had a dollar for everyone who named their first bearded dragon Spike, I could probably buy a real spaceship to take me to Orbis Pagona. Bearded dragons have these spikes to defend themselves, sort of. They aren't super sharp when a beardy is resting, but when they feel threatened, they can inflate themselves with air, which makes them larger and pushes the spikes into a more erect position, not only making them appear larger and therefore hopefully more intimidating to predators, but it can also poke the inside of the mouth of, say, a dingo, snake, or parenti. For the Neuchosaurs, now faced with savage dragons who take small chunks out of them and run away, this tactic really doesn't work anymore. The mortal Aceris are going for weak parts and ripping out small chunks, and obviously aren't intimidated by their size. Neuchosaurs with larger and harder spikes are less likely to fall victim to savage dragons, which makes them generally more successful. Over generations, these Neuchosaurids develop thicker and more robust scales that are hard to bypass even for the mortal Aceris. Omaliscutus crassicata, whose full name means flat shields with thick tails, are descendants of Nuchasaurus that have developed thick armor-like spikes and scales that are well adapted to deter and even fight back against savage dragons. Omaliscutus remains roughly the same size as their ancestors, being a little bit heavier, 105 pounds or 48 kilograms, and a little bit longer at 78 inches or 2 meters. Their necks have actually become a little bit shorter than that of their predecessors, due to it being a pretty big weak point for predators to exploit. Their thick scales, like their name suggests, covers their top side as well as their limbs like a shield, and this is one of two ways they will defend themselves from attack. They will drop to the ground and flatten themselves, covering their soft underside from all angles. This essentially turns them into a spiky rock. After a few attempts of trying to get through this thick armor, Immortal Asteris will likely give up and walk off. Skill issue. Much like manatees or even dodo birds, Neuchosaurs were docile and passive because they evolved with no predators. The pressure from predators like savage dragons has made Homaliscutus far more defensive in comparison. A Homaliscutus will fight back like any other beardy would, with tooth and claw, but will also employ the use of their thick tail, which is filled with dense, fast twitch muscle fibers that allow it to be swung at predators. A strike from this tail could easily daze or kill a mortal Aceris. If a Homaliscutus were to hit you or me with this attack, it would feel a lot like catching a spiky scooter with your ankle. Homaliscutus maintain the group behavior of Neuchosaurs, but the nuances of mating and competition have changed. Again, pressure from predators has made them far less docile, translating into their intraspecific competition. Instead of showing off their colorful beards, male Homaliscutus will fight for mating rights by shoving each other to the ground over and over until the loser walks off in submission. 
Because the males are aggressive towards one another, Omaliscuta's buffets are smaller on average, with one, maybe two males with no more than four females. Some buffets of Homalascutus can be seen in congregations with Nutrisaurus buffets and harems of cow beetles, and often find themselves being the guard of the larger group, deterring mortal Lacerus who will try to go after Nutrisaurus, young cow beetles, as well as young Homalascutus. Real quick everybody, I just wanted to let you guys know that I am decreasing the price of Tier 2 and Tier 3 patrons, both by $5 each. So that means for anyone who is already a Tier 2 or Tier 3 patron, you will be billed $5 less next billing period, and you'll get an email from Patreon about that. And that means for people who aren't patrons yet, you can now become a Tier 2 patron for $10 a month and be able to see videos up to three days before the upload on YouTube. And once we reach our goal for $250 a month for the whole Patreon, that will then be seven days before it's uploaded on YouTube. That was it. Let's get back to it. Another group of Nutrisaurs evolved to deal with their predators in a simpler way. The original path of eat more, get bigger, eat taller plants, repeat, worked just fine. Nutrisaurs with longer necks and longer tails to support them could reach higher and higher plants. They naturally became much larger as well, which by proxy makes them far less likely to fall victim to savage dragons. Arboretus Shalanopes, whose full name means the tree-eating, turtle-like foot, are descendants of those ever-taller growing Nuchosaurids. They are far larger than any other beardy on the planet so far, reaching lengths of over 13 feet or 4 meters, weighing over 180 kilograms or 400 pounds. Measuring from the ground to the top of their head, they can be as tall as 5.5 feet or 1.6 meters. They of course feed on foliage that is higher up, usually the tops of bushes and lower hanging branches. For this, they have longer teeth and a very subtle crest at the top of their head or stronger jaw muscle attachment, allowing them to shear off large amounts of rough foliage while expending less energy. And just to make sure their food is properly broken down, Arboretus will also ingest gastroliths to grind up plant matter in their stomachs, just like a lot of other herbivorous animals on Earth. To support their weight, they have thicker and more robust limbs, which, like their name suggests, end in feet that are starting to resemble turtle feet, or more accurately, tortoise feet. These guys tend to move with a high walk rather than a sprawl like most genera of Pagonia on the planet. Like their cousin, the Homalascutus, Arboretus Shalonopes are perfectly capable of defending themselves against Mortalaceras. They are so large that they can simply kick or stomp on them, but that doesn't mean the Mortalaceras don't try and shear off a chunk if the giant isn't paying attention. To avoid having too many bits of flesh ripped off, Arboretus will let out loud bellows to warn each other to the presence of predators. <coughs> They do so by breathing in a large amount of air into their lungs, rapidly pushing it out their nose, catching on fleshy grooves in their nasal cavity to create sound. This notifies the rest of the group to be on guard. Buffets of Arboretus, when it comes to mating behavior, are more similar to Nuchosaurus than they are to Homalascutus, but instead of making use of a colorful beard, females will choose the male with the loudest and most pleasant sounding call. We see this biological raid alarm being put to great use when in congregations with all species present quickly learning that when the big guys start making noise, there's danger nearby. Unfortunately, the Nuchosaurus Ateosis just isn't fit to survive much longer, with predators like savage dragons around. They lack the defensive instinct that the new kids on the block have. Wandering buffets of Nuchosaurus rapidly disappear from Orbis Pagona's ecosystems, leading them to the brink of extinction. However, the groups of Nuchosaurus that stuck with their strange-looking friends in their interspecies congregations we're far better off than the vagrant members of the species. We start to see a pretty unique four-way symbiotic relationship develop between the animals in the congregation. Arboretus eat their own taller foliage and act as lookouts and biological raid sirens, while Hamalascutus eat the lower shrubbery and fight off predators. Cow beetles, who are the only grass eaters in the group, are also none too pleased with the presence of mortal Lacerus and will also take part in fighting them off, sometimes by flinging them with their massive headgear. Nuchosaurus, though safe among the other members of the congregation, is the most vulnerable of the group and kind of dead weight. Perhaps in the future, they might evolve to fill a more important role. While a lot of other animals were getting bigger to fill niches or avoid predators, it was advantageous for some to actually get smaller. Back here on Earth, we see that really most lizards we have today are primarily bug eaters, bearded dragons included. But most of these lizards are much smaller than the bearded dragon. Anoles, geckos, chameleons, and a lot of agamids closely related to bearded dragons like garden lizards, all for the most part occupy the niche of small arboreal bug-eating lizards. 
Bearded dragons are pretty good at eating bugs, but generally avoid the smallest of bugs that aren't worth the energy expended. Over generations, smaller bearded dragons that can afford to go after smaller bugs without expending too much energy have access to a food source that larger members of their species don't, making them more successful. Velo Draco Minimus, whose name means the smallest swift dragon, are descendants of basal bearded dragons that have evolved to fill the empty niche of small bug-eating lizard. They can be about 5 to 9 inches, or 12 to 22 centimeters long, weighing no more than 7 grams. They have a few different adaptations that make being the little guy a bit easier, the first of which are toe pads at the bottom of their feet that allow them to climb and stick to surfaces far more efficiently. On account of them being so small, they are pretty fast and also pretty adept at leaping between branches, something that really helps them with chasing bugs and avoiding predators. Also by virtue of being small, Velo Dracos have a hard time finding each other from a distance. Males will use their brightly colored dewlaps like a flag to signal to other members of their species instead of to intimidate like with most other beardeds. Velo Dracos have spread pretty much all across the planet, living primarily in forests where bugs like beetles, ants, flies, etc. are abundant. Because of this, they are the most successful of all bearded dragon descendants on the planet. Of course, the downside of this success is that they are small enough to be food for just about everyone especially in the forests, where their bright flag dewlaps make them a prime target for dragonhawks and lizards like the Pagona lingatox, who can grab them from afar like a sniper, and Pagona sandaras, who leap from tree to tree looking for food. Before I go, yes, I know it's been almost four months since the last episode of Warpus Pagona, and this is for a few reasons. The Assessing Survival series is my main focus for the channel, and I am just generally less motivated to work on this project than I am on that one. There's also just less of an incentive to make Orbis Pagona. Orbis Pagona episodes will maybe reach around 40,000 views and then completely flatline, while most episodes of Assessing Survival easily exceed that within a week or two and keep growing. And two, I have pretty bad adult ADHD, meaning I have the attention span of a goldfish's brain transplanted into a year old puppy. And for now the 11 month lifespan of my channel, that has made working on videos very difficult. Especially since I quit my job to do this full time, I'm just not burning off as much energy as I used to. But with the introduction of prescription drugs, writing, drawing, editing, and just my life in general has become a lot easier recently. So hopefully you guys will see higher quality videos uploaded more frequently, and I will fit in Orpus Pagona wherever I can. But really, if you guys want to see more of this, the biggest favor you can do me is leave a like, a comment, subscribe, and especially share the video wherever you can. As always, big shout out to our patrons, some of which include Fluffy Dino, Lex Gun, Galactic Narwhal, Tyler Sparks, The Juan Kaiser, Mr. Matt, Skadu Master, Rhubarb6000, and T Rex Dudes Forever, Nocteinbruch, I don't think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's how I'm gonna say it from now on, and Alec Foise. Anyways, thanks again for tuning in, and I will see you next time, dorks.